Hello everybody and welcome to another amazing episode of History of the Marvel Universe. This channel is brought to you in part by Patreon supporters. If you would like to help decide what topics get covered on the channel and get your name the special thanks at the end of each episode, you can sign up for as little as $1 per month over at patreon.com slash marymarvelate. The link is in the description below. Before we get into the meat of this episode, let's begin by discussing some continuity notes regarding J. Jonah Jameson's age and parentage. At one point it was shown that Jonah was the editor of the Daily Bugle newspaper all the way back in World War II, as seen in an issue of Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos. Of course, because of the sliding timeline, this would make him unnaturally long-lived if it were still the case, and so it was later implied that this was actually a different man, Walter Jameson. Interestingly, this was first referenced in a prose story published in a Marvel UK magazine in which Walter Old Man Jameson was presumed to be Jonah's father. While this is now known not to be the case, some familial connection is certainly possible given the circumstances and the similarities between the two. In truth, Jonah's full name is John Jonah Jameson Jr., but of course we'll refer to him mostly as Jonah. His father, then, was John Jonah Jameson Sr., but he usually went by Jay. When Jonah was just a boy, Jay abandoned him, leaving him in the custody of his brother. There's also conflicting information on the name of Jonah's stepfather. Spider-Man's Tangled Web number 20 refers to him as David Jameson and his wife as Betty. The official handbook of the Marvel Universe named him David Burnall and also identified Jonah's biological mother as Betty Burnall. However, the official index to the Marvel Universe, perhaps erroneously, refers to him as Brian Jameson. The truth is probably some combination of these, and in any event, Jonah grew up in a broken home and his stepfather was an abusive war veteran. As a young boy, like many kids, he admired costumed superheroes, notably Captain America's youthful sidekick, Bucky. However, he eventually outgrew such things, and one story claims that he was a child when Bucky was supposedly killed at the end of World War II. As was the case with the Walter Jameson retcon, Jonah's age during that time period, if he was even born at all, is going to be inconsistent purely by the nature of Marvel's sliding timeline, and depends greatly on the publication date of the story from which the information comes. As an example, in an issue of Spectacular Spider-Man from 1983, it was said that Jonah began his journalism career as a copyboy for the Daily Bugle during the Great Depression. But in 2009, we get a look at his father's driver's license, indicating that Jameson Sr. was born in 1939. I bring this up to point out that dates and details like that can and do change as time goes on, and I should probably dedicate a full video to explaining the nature of the sliding timeline at some point. If that's something you'd like to see, be sure to let me know in the comments. But that aside, let's get to the story at hand. As previously mentioned, Jonah had a tough childhood with an angry stepfather. In school, he was short-tempered and at one point was forced to join the photography club after ripping a pencil sharpener off the wall. Soon after that, a group of jocks harassed and made fun of him for this supposedly nerdy activity. But Jonah refused to be victimized and knocked the living daylights out of his three would-be attackers. This impressed another student, Joan, who would soon become his longtime girlfriend. With her, Jonah was happy, and they tore it up on the dance floor during their high school prom. He even stood up to his stepfather that night, taking and smoking the old man's cigar in front of him. Jonah got incredibly sick and threw up immediately after, but Joan stayed with him. He apparently dropped out of high school after becoming a reporter, but he completed his GED and later worked for a campus newspaper under Barney Bushkin, who would later become a rival publisher at the Daily Globe. While Bushkin admonished Jonah for his sensationalist writing, Jameson pranked his editor with an exploding pen and quit. At 20 years old, Jonah was a reporter for the New York Herald Journal Express and investigating a corruption scandal in the NYPD. However, his police contact, Sam, was shot and killed in front of him. Furthermore, Jonah saw the man who did it, a crooked cop named Kenner. 
His editor, Windmere, killed the story because it couldn't be substantiated, but Jonah refused to give up and continued to investigate alongside an Irish copyboy named Danny only to be immediately roughed up by a group of cops who wanted to dissuade him. Sometime after that, Jonah was approached by the owner of the Daily Bugle newspaper, William Walter Goodman. Jameson had previously worked for the Bugle as a copyboy, but left when he had opportunities to pursue real reporting elsewhere. But by this point, Goodman wanted him back and even reintroduced him to cigars, which Jonah developed a taste for. After several weeks of digging, Jameson found another informant in the police, Michael O. Hill, who provided him with a key to a lock at the Port Authority bus station. Thinking this would lead him to the evidence he needed, Jonah and Danny headed there right away. But when he saw Kenner in the crowd, Jonah gave the copy boy the key and tried to follow him. While he lost the crooked cop in the sea of people, Jonah made a startling realization. The whole thing started to seem like a setup, but by the time Jameson made his way back to the locker, Danny had already attempted to open it, triggering an explosion that cost the boy his life. Sometime later, Goodman found Jameson nearly passed out on his kitchen floor, drunk and despondent over Danny's death. However, Goodman convinced him not to give up, and together they formulated a plan. Jonah marched into the police station and confronted Kenner in his office, goading him into attacking him. He tricked the crooked cop into admitting that he'd killed both Sam and Danny, all the while wearing a transmitter so that Goodman could record everything that was said. After that, Jameson became a full-time reporter for the Daily Bugle, a war correspondent, and a vocal opponent of costumed superheroes. He married his high school sweetheart Joan, and the two had a son named John. However, this marriage ended in tragedy when Joan was killed by a masked gunman while Jonah was away. Pouring himself into his work, J. Jonah Jameson eventually became the editor-in-chief of the Daily Bugle, renowned for his support of civil rights and his opposition to organized crime. When the Bugle was later up for sale by Goodman's heirs, Jameson put every dollar he had into making it his own. His efforts were successful, and as the Bugle's new publisher, he eventually became a millionaire member of New York's elite Century Club. His media empire grew from there with other publications like Now Magazine. Although his irate and miserly attitude earned him a reputation as a notorious penny pincher, he secretly gave to various charities and took care of his employees when it counted. There are, of course, too many Daily Bugle employees to list them all, but some noteworthy examples include the following. Betty Brandt, who started as Jonah's teenage secretary but eventually became a reporter. Joe Robertson, aka Robbie, the city editor who later became editor-in-chief and a host of other reporters including Ben Urich, Ned Leeds, and many, many others. But eventually Jonah would find someone to project all of his ire onto when a masked performer calling himself the Amazing Spider-Man began making televised appearances demonstrating unnatural strength and powers. Most notably, he appeared on a program called It's Amazing, and because of this, Jonah's son John, who had grown up and become an astronaut, was cut from appearing on the show in favor of Spider-Man. It was in that same episode, with J. Jonah Jameson in the audience, in which a villain called Supercharger attacked, intentionally wanting to discredit superhumans by threatening the crowd. Spider-Man successfully stopped Supercharger, but Jameson was convinced that the Masked Man was nothing more than a thrill-seeking vigilante. He wrote a series of scathing editorials and began a media campaign against the wall crawler, effectively tanking his show business career. Even after Spider-Man saved John from a malfunctioning space capsule, Jonah blamed the Masked Man for the failed launch and twisted the facts against him. Spider-Man's vigilante activities only increased after that, and Jameson would continue his tirades against him. This was aided somewhat by a high school student named Peter Parker, who provided him with pictures of Spider-Man that nobody else was able to get. While Peter's shots were somewhat amateurish, Jonah allowed him to be a freelance photographer for the Bugle. 
partly because upon doing a background check on the kid, he learned of a recent family tragedy that was undoubtedly still affecting him. He continued his campaigns against Spider-Man, but in his private moments he admitted to himself that he was actually jealous of him. At one point it was discovered that the crime boss known as the Big Man was actually Daily Bugle reporter Frederick Foswell. But after serving his sentence and vowing to reform, Jonah allowed Foswell to return to work. When an enigmatic new hero calling himself Mysterio promised to defeat Spider-Man, Jameson publicly supported him. But Mysterio was revealed as a criminal himself and defeated by the Web Slinger. Jonah's anger would not be stopped, however, particularly because Spidey would sometimes visit him to berate and embarrass him personally. At one point, he hired a private investigator named Mac Gargan to follow Parker and find out how he got his pictures of Spider-Man. When this took too long to yield results, he instead brought Gargan to a scientist named Farley Stillwell. Paying them both, Jonah had Stillwell endow Gargan with the powers of a scorpion so that he could defeat Spider-Man. This backfired, though, when the Scorpion was driven mad and developed a strong hatred for Jonah. Furthermore, Stillwell tried to turn Gargan back to normal, but lost his life in the attempt. Feeling guilty over his involvement in this, Jonah confided in a friend of his, a fellow Century Club member named Norman Osborne. When another scientist, Spencer Smythe, approached Jameson with an invention of his own, Jonah was initially hesitant, but he was soon convinced to invest in Smythe's machine, the first of many Spider Slayer robots. Jameson himself piloted the robot remotely, but Spider-Man ultimately escaped. When Wilson Fisk operated in secret as the kingpin of crime, Jameson wrote a series of editorials that threatened to shine a light on his activities. Jonah was abducted and held captive alongside Spider-Man, but the masked hero was able to save them both. During that ordeal, Frederick Foswell was fatally shot while protecting Jameson, proving once and for all that he'd reformed. Later, Jonah contacted Smythe to build a second Spider Slayer robot. But when it became clear that Jameson wanted to capture the vigilante alive, Smythe took over the controls. He was intent on killing their foe, but ultimately this plan also failed. He later gave Smythe one more chance, but after losing control of that machine as well, Jonah finally stopped working with the Mad Doctor. Later, when Norman Osborn was seemingly killed in an encounter with Spider-Man, Jonah blamed the Masked Menace for his friend's murder, not knowing that Osborn was secretly the villainous Green Goblin. He contracted the hero for hire, Luke Cage, to take out Spider-Man. Luke pulled out of the deal after learning that Spidey was falsely accused, but Jonah soon had bigger problems when his son John was transformed into the lycanthropic man-wolf by a red gemstone he'd found on the moon. Although John successfully regained his human form, the man-wolf identity would be a recurring presence in his life for years to come. Later, Jonah was attacked by Max Markham, a former professional wrestler known as the Grizzly. Over a decade prior, Jameson's scathing editorials of Markham's violent behavior ruined the Grizzly's career. Jonah was saved by Spider-Man once again, but of course he'd never admit that. Following this, he hired Daniel Burkhart to torment Spider-Man by pretending to be the ghost of Mysterio. He also approached Harlan Stillwell, the brother of Farley Stillwell who created the Scorpion, with a plan to create a new superhero. But instead, Harlan was held at gunpoint by a criminal named Richard Deacon, who forced the Doctor to transform him into the human fly before killing him. For Jonah's next scheme, he met with another scientist, Dr. Marla Madison. While he'd lost faith in Smythe, he thought there was still merit in the idea of his Spider Slayer robots, and had Marla design a new one. While this plan also failed, Jonah and Marla stayed in contact, and a romance began to blossom between them. During this time, Jonah also published a magazine aimed at women, aptly named Woman Magazine, but often clashed with its editor, former U.S. Air Force pilot Carol Danvers, regarding its content. Meanwhile, he was anonymously sent a series of photos that seemed to show Spider-Man disposing of Peter Parker's dead body. 
he confronted Peter, thinking that Spider-Man had killed him and taken his place. However, Peter was able to convince him that the photos were actually fake. In truth, the pictures had been sent by Norman Osborn's drug-addled son Harry and showed Spider-Man disposing of a supposedly dead clone created by a supervillain known as the Jackal. When Jonah published editorials speaking out against an apparent terrorist group known as the People's Liberation Front, they responded by hiring a hitman, known as the Hitman, to abduct him. This time he was rescued by the combined efforts of Spider-Man and the Punisher. Meanwhile, Spencer Smythe learned that his days were numbered, as the radioactive materials he'd used in the construction of his spider slayers had left him terminally ill. Seeking revenge on both Jonah and Spider-Man, Smythe mesmerized John Jameson and unleashed the Man-Wolf once again. John seemingly fell to his doom as a result of this, but the Godstone that transformed him into the Man-Wolf teleported him away, saving his life. Smythe subsequently abducted Jonah and Spider-Man, strapping them both to the same bomb. Jonah nearly cracked under the pressure, but Spider-Man succeeded in removing the explosive and saving them once again. Jameson was later targeted by a mad scientist named Jonas Harrow. Harrow nearly drove Jameson mad as part of a plot to attack Spider-Man, but the old codger was stubborn and was soon back to normal after being rescued. Months later, John returned, scarcely remembering the extra-dimensional adventures he embarked on in the interim. When an old colleague named Ian Fate returned as a sorcerer alongside the monstrous Man-Thing, he expected Jonah to help him reshape the world. Jameson of course refused, but he was able to convince Fate to take a more peaceful path. He also did some investigative reporting, at one point interrogating the Kingpin himself while looking into a waterfront extortion racket. Later, a supervillain called the Hobgoblin attempted to blackmail Jameson, threatening to reveal his hand in the origin of the Scorpion. While Spider-Man defeated the Hobgoblin, Jonah voluntarily went public with the information himself, stepping down as editor-in-chief and turning that position over to Joe Robertson. After that, despite another attempted attack from the Scorpion, J. Jonah Jameson married Marla Madison. While he did occasionally hire mercenary groups like Silver Sable's Wild Pack or the mutant hunting X-Factor to target Spider-Man, Jonah's propensity towards creating supervillains softened and he was more often content to editorialize, even while being kept in check by Robbie Robertson. He still managed to get tied up in various plots, like when the Chameleon abducted and impersonated him, until he was found out by Spider-Man. At one point, the Daily Bugle was bought by Thomas Fireheart, secretly the mercenary known as the Puma. He used the newspaper in an attempt to repair Spider-Man's long-damaged reputation, primarily because he himself had been tricked into attacking the hero due to Jameson's editorials. Despite no longer owning the paper, Jonah was still a journalist and at one point wrote scathing indictments of a neo-Nazi named Eric Hartman. When his forces attacked the Daily Bugle, Hartman himself nearly got the drop on Spider-Man while he was rescuing an innocent civilian. This time, however, it was Jonah who saved Spidey, tackling and defeating the neo-Nazi. Fireheart eventually relinquished control of the Bugle and Jameson, as publisher, investigated the anti-mutant strike force Operation Zero Tolerance. During this time, Jonah was approached by the man behind OZT, a human-sentinel hybrid named Bastion. He offered Jonah secret information about the mutant outlaws, the X-Men. However, the one thing that Jameson hated more than costumed vigilantes was racism and bigotry, and he refused to accept anything from Bastion. Around this time, Jonah was also tormented by the pumpkin-headed Mad Jack, secretly Daniel Burkhart, the man Jameson had previously hired to impersonate Mysterio, working in conjunction with Maguire Beck, the cousin of Quentin Beck, the original Mysterio. Mad Jack had been hired by Norman Osborn, who it turns out had faked his death all those years prior, and forced Jonah to sell the bugle by threatening his family. As a result of all of that, Osborne successfully became the new owner of the Daily Bugle. However, Jonah regained control after Osborne was driven mad while seeking power with a mystic ritual called the Gathering of Five. Also involved with this ritual was a 15-year-old girl named Maddie Franklin, the daughter of Jonah and Marla's close friend, Jerry. 
Maddie actually gained the power that Norman was seeking and used it to become the new Spider-Woman. She stayed with Jonah and Merla for a time, and after her father died, the Jamesons became her foster parents. Jameson was later kidnapped by Mysterio and Mad Jack, but this time he was rescued by Spider-Man and Daredevil. That didn't stop him from trying to capitalize on the revelation of Daredevil's secret identity, but Ben Urich's refusal to participate did. When the Daily Globe reported that Daredevil was secretly a blind lawyer named Matt Murdock, both Peter Parker and Ben Urich claimed to know his real identity and that the tabloid story was false. Regardless, this gave Jonah the idea of outing Spider-Man in a similar manner, and he hired the superhuman private investigator Jessica Jones to discover his identity. Jones tricked Jonah using his money for charitable pursuits which were supposedly relevant to the investigation. However, she later saved his foster daughter Maddie after she was kidnapped by drug dealers who used her to produce mutant growth hormones. It was during this debacle that Jonah and Marla learned about Maddie's powers. After over a decade of campaigning against Spider-Man, even Jonah began to feel the futility of his actions. This was made worse when he was sued for libel, resulting in humiliation. He agreed to run a new Bugle feature called The Pulse, theoretically presenting unbiased coverage of superheroes with input from Jessica Jones, but this eventually fell apart. During the superhero civil war, Jameson was shocked to learn Spider-Man's true identity when he unmasked on live TV, but this information was later wiped from everyone's memory by magical spell. Also around the time of the Civil War, Ben Urich was fired from the Daily Bugle, but joined forces with another reporter, Sally Floyd, to start a rival newspaper called The Front Line. This was made possible by a secret benefactor who was actually J. Jonah Jameson himself. Later, while media mogul Dexter Bennett was trying to buy out the Bugle, mounting pressures caused Jameson to suffer from a heart attack. While Jonah was recovering in the hospital, Marla, concerned for his health, sold the Bugle to Bennett. The paper was rebranded to the DB, but Bennett's overbearing management style caused Robertson and many others to leave and join Urich's paper, The Front Line. Jonah eventually recovered and successfully ran for mayor of New York City. He directed city funds towards the creation of an anti-spider squad, but as usual this only resulted in him making an ass of himself. Around this time, his estranged father Jay also returned and started dating Peter Parker's Aunt May. Those two later got married, resulting in Jonah Jameson and Peter Parker technically being related. After that, Dexter Bennett's media empire was ruined when the DB building was destroyed by the supervillain Electro. This allowed Jonah and Marla to buy the Daily Bugle name back from Bennett's shareholders, gifting it to Robbie Robertson so that the front line could become the new Daily Bugle. However, he was soon met with several tragedies, starting with the death of his foster daughter, Maddie Franklin, at the hands of the sadistic family of Craven the Hunter. After that, when Alistair Smythe, the son of Spencer Smythe, turned himself into a spider slayer and sought revenge for his father's death, Smythe attempted to kill Jonah, but Marla pushed him out of the way and was fatally injured as a result. While Spider-Man defeated Smythe, Marla, with her dying breath, pleaded with Jonah not to waste any more of his life on hate. And for once, he didn't try to claim the tragedy was Spider-Man's fault, instead blaming himself. When Norman Osborn later waged a war in New York with his so-called Goblin Nation, Mayor Jameson tried to combat it by contracting the company Alchemax to build a fleet of Goblin Slayer robots. However, those robots were reprogrammed by the goblins to attack the city, and in the ensuing scandal, Jameson stepped down as mayor. After that, he returned to journalism, first as a contributor to the Fact Channel, and later as a writer on his own personal blog, Threats and Menaces, among other enterprises. 
He also suffered from one more tragedy when his father succumbed to illness and passed away. This was also during the time that new U technologies coerced Jonah into cooperating with their conspiracy by reviving Marla and Maddie using cloning techniques, but these clones ultimately dissolved, leaving Jonah alone once more. After that, he successfully scheduled an interview with his longtime arch nemesis, the so called Amazing Spider Man himself. While Jonah was his usual belligerent self, eventually, after an argument, he began to break down. He admitted that with his loved ones gone, he had nothing left except his hatred of Spider Man. However, Spider-Man told Jonah that he wasn't alone, doing the unthinkable and unmasking in front of him, revealing that he'd secretly been Peter Parker the entire time. Since then, the two have reconciled, and Jonah has turned over a new leaf, attempting to help Spider-Man and even trying to repair his damaged reputation. As for whether this is actually helpful, or if he just ends up getting in the way, well, in either case, J. Jonah Jameson will continue to do what he thinks is right and report the facts as he sees them. But that's all I've got for this week, and thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, share the video, and subscribe for more Marvelous content. Be sure to leave a comment letting me know what Marvel hero or villain you want to hear about next, and as always, the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description below if you would like to read them for yourself, as well as links to other places you can find me, including my Patreon page, where for only a dollar a month you can get your name in these special thanks here. So until next time, true believers, Excelsior!